What is going on guys welcome back in today's video we're going to visualize the law of large numbers in python so let us get right into it now we're not going to get too scientific and too mathematical in this video because the main focus is on the visualization part in python so we're going to talk briefly about the law of large numbers but the focus is not going to be on the statistics in this video so the basic principle behind the law of large numbers is that the more we increase the sample size the closer the mean of the sample gets to the actual average of the population. So, for example, if we flip a coin uh, a million times, we're going to expect to have a distribution of 50-50 because a coin flip is random and you have a 50% chance to get heads and you have 50% chance to get tails. Now, if you just flip the coin 20 times, for example, you're not going to necessarily see this distribution. So you might as well see something like 17 and 3 even though it's unlikely it can happen because random is random and unlikely doesn't mean impossible or doesn't mean it's not going to happen so you can actually end up with something like 17 and 3 so 17 heads for example and three tails now this is even more unlikely if you do it with 100 coin flips but it's very, very, very unlikely to have such a distribution if you do a million coin flips. And this is, you could say, roughly the law of large numbers. Again, this is not uh, the, the perfect scientific definition here, but we're not going to focus too much on the statistics, but we're just going to see how the sample size influences uh, the distribution in Python. So we're going to visualize that. And we're going to do that by just saying nvmain.py. We're going to open up a new file here. And what we're going to do here is we're going to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And we're going to import random. So we're just going to simulate some coin flips here. And we're going to do that in, uh, in the following way. We're going to say heads, tails is a list and both indices here. So heads and tails are going to be zero at the start. And then we're just going to say four whatever in range and the amount of coin flips that we want to simulate. Now let's do 10 in the beginning. Uh, we're going to say for uh, something in range 10, we're going to just simulate coin flips. So we're going to say heads and tails. And depending on what we get as a result here, we're going to either increase index zero or index one. And we could just say that index zero means heads and index one means tails. And um, we can just do it like that. We can say random rand int from zero to one. So either zero or one. And depending on the result, we're also going to choose the respective index. So we don't need to do any fancy position arithmetics here. And we're just going to increase the number at that particular index by one. So this is just increasing either heads or tails, depending on what the random coin flip result is. Now, then we can go ahead and say plt bar, which is just going to plot a bar, pot, a bar plot. And we're just going to say 0, 1 here. And then we're going to plot heads, tails here as distribution. And we're going to choose the colors blue and red, like that. Now, if we do it like that, and in the end we say plt.show, we're not going to see the result that we want because we want to have a live update. We want to see, okay, what happens after one coin flip, after two coin flips and so on. So what we actually need to do is we need to say PLT. Oh, I think I forgot a bracket here. We're going to say PLT pause and then 0 0.05, for example, like that. Now, let me just check if I have my uh, Windows server online. I don't have it, so we need to start Xming here, um, which is what I, I'm using to plot something from the Windows Linux subsystem. And once we have that, we can just go ahead and say Python three main.py. And we're going to see a live simulation of coin flips. Now, we didn't see it because it started in the background. So let's rerun this. And as you can see, this is what happens with 10 coin flips. This is one possible result. And as you can see, we get seven and three, which is 70% and 3%. And it's not what we expect from a coin flip because the coin flip is actually 50 50 by nature. Uh, you could say it's a binomial distribution. So as you can see, doing this with 10 coin flips doesn't give us uh, any reasonable result. Now we can do this a couple more times and see what happens. So here we get 
actually 50 50 which is pretty good this is what we're expecting but it doesn't have to be the case you know if you do just 10 coin flips it can also be 10 0 right it's it's unlikely but it can happen we're going to do this a couple more times here so even though oftentimes it's uh 50 50 or 60 40 as you can see sometimes it's 80 20 and this is not what we're expecting so we can actually go ahead and see what happens if we increase the sample size. So let's say we do 100 coin flips. Now by doing that, we're going to get way more coin flips. And the likelihood of ending up with something like 8020 is very, very small. Now you can see that here, we're still going to get some pretty unbalanced results, which is, you know, it's it's unusual, but it can happen even if you do 100 coin flips. But you're going to see the more we increase the coin flip amount, the more um, balanced this is going to get. And as you can see, even though it's not really balanced, we have 60 40, around 60 40, let's put it that way, uh, which is still not too bad. So we can go ahead and do the same thing again with a 1000 coin flips. And we're going to decrease this number a little bit to have it a little bit faster. And you're going to see the more coin flips we do, the more balanced the graph will be in the end. Now in the beginning, you might see some unbalances like uh, unbalances like here. But overall, after a 1000 coin flips, you're going to see that this distribution is actually approaching 50 50, it's getting more, it's getting closer to 50 50. Uh, the more we increase the sample size, as you can see. So we're going to end this right now. There you go. And we're going to just make a little change here. We're not going to plot it all the time, we're going to say, we're going to change this to x so that we have a variable. And we will, we will say if x is or if x modulo 25, or let's say modulo 50 equals zero. So we're going to just plot every 50th plot, or 50th coin flip, you could say. And uh, then we can go with 10,000 here and see what happens. So if we do that, you're going to see that it's getting way faster. And you can see that we already have like 2000 coin flips. And it's, it's pretty balanced. So even though it's not 5050 exactly, and it's probably never going to be 5050 exactly. Uh, it's very, very close. And you're not going to see some uh, something like 8020 or something like that. So the larger the sample size, the more accurate it's going to be. And the interesting part is I'm, I'm doing this video here, because a couple of days ago, I posted an Instagram plot, uh, not plot a Instagram poll, where I asked you guys or the Instagram followers to flip a coin and press what you get as results. And I got hat tails as an answer, uh, or you had hats and tails as answers. And it was like 75 and 25, which is completely unrealistic, because I think uh, 3000 people or something like that, voted on this poll. And you can say with a very high confidence that those people did not actually flip a coin, which afterwards, I got a lot of messages of people saying that they didn't actually flip a coin. But it was quite interesting, because you got 75 and 25. And it's very, very unlikely to have this distribution when the actual distribution is binomial with 50 50. And you have 3000 people. So a sample size of 3000, it's very unlikely to get that result. All right, now let us get to an example that's a little bit more interesting. And this is rolling dice. And we're not just going to roll one die, we're going to roll two dice. And we're going to look at the distribution of the sum of these two dice. So we're going to just start with dice sums. And we're going to start with 12 zeros. Um, because we have we can have two as a result, three as a result four, and the maximum that we can have is 12 if we get two sixes. So we can not actually have one because we have two dice. And if both are one, we're going to have at least uh, two. So we're not able to get one as a result. So actually, we would have 11. But let's just leave it at 12 for now. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to just simulate are rolling these two dice. So we're going to say four x in range. And let's just start with 100 here. We're going to say dice sum is going to be random dot rand int from one, come on from one to six, plus random dot rand int from one to six. And then we're going to say dice sums 
at this particular index is going to be increased by one. And we're going to plot uh, in the beginning, we're going to plot everything. So we're just going to say plt bar. And here we can just plot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, even though one is not a possible outcome. Um, and then die sums. And the color is going to be just, I don't know, blue. Like that. And then we're going to say plt dot pause. 0, 0, 0, 1, and then PLT show in the end. So this is just simulating dice. And for those of you who know a little bit about statistics, you're probably going to know that the expected result is a Gaussian bell curve. So a curve like that, um, with values like seven, six and eight being the most frequent. Why? Because we have a lot of possibilities to get those numbers as a result. For example, the number two or the result two is very difficult to get because the only combination is to get two ones. And the same is true for 12 because you need to get two sixes here. Uh, whereas seven can be done with three and four, four and three, two and five, five and two, one and six, six and one and so on. So we have way more possibilities. And this is why we have a Gaussian bell curve. Now let's see if this is true if we roll 100 times. So we're just going to say Python three main dot py. And we're going to simulate that. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it, it's pretty slow here. So let me just restart this. Let's just change this to or actually, let's just say, we're only going to plot if we have x modulo 10 for now equals zero, then we're going to plot this. Otherwise, we're not going to plot it. And this should be a bit faster. So what do we have here? Dice sum plus one index out of range. Oh, probably because I need to say dice sum minus one, right? Yeah. There you go. Let's see what happens. So as you can see, this already looks a little bit like a bell curve, even though it's not a perfect bell curve. Um, but the interesting thing is that if we, for example, just do, uh, let's do, I don't know, 30, we're not very likely to get, uh, or it's not very probable that we're going to end up with a bell curve, even though six and seven, for example, seven didn't get uh, any, any sums at all here. Um, but all in all, what happens with 30 times is not predictable. So actually, it could be completely uh, the opposite of a Gaussian bell curve if we do this a couple of times here. Because again, the law of large number, for, for example, here, we don't have any bell curve at all, we have like a straight line up here, and then it goes down a little bit. Um, but if we change this to not 30, but to I don't know, 10,000, and we plot every 50th roll here, we're going to see that this almost becomes a perfect bell curve. So over time, the more samples we have, the, the larger the sample size, the more this will go and look like a bell curve over time. So as you can see, this is a bell curve, a Gaussian bell curve. And the more the more dice we roll, the more it's going to end up looking like a uh, like a perfect bell curve. So as you can see, now we can you can do this one more time and speed the process up a little bit. So I need to close this here. There you go. So I can just go ahead and say every 200th. And we're going to notice the changes way faster. As you can see, it almost looks like an optimization algorithm. So as you can see, this is a perfect bell curve here even though we're doing random samples. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.